Oh, like... st- well, yeah, sleep, I guess. So, yeah, going yeah. into that. We're live now. Hello. Um, yeah, I, in terms of sleep throughout this whole thing, I have ended up having quite a, a regular switch to American time where I end up sleeping as if I'm from California and going to bed at midnight in California, whereas actually that's 8 a.m. here. I'm just going through the whole night working, but then the past few days it's been like four hours here. Like I felt really tired the, like this yeah. morning and then I couldn't actually go to bed. and like It's just this really awkward feeling of, you know, it's just almost asleep, but almost not. Like, ugh. Lethargy. Oh, how weird. What, what yeah. made that happen? No idea. I don't know, it's just come out of nowhere. I think it, uh, say no idea. It could be something to do with the heat. And then, you know. Anyway. Um, hello, Dave, down in the comments. Everybody else that's joining us. Please check the Nightbot commands. I have changed them. Um, if you tag somebody properly with their full name in the uh, the live chat, then it should now work. Um, but again, this is just experimental. Let me know. Uh, Sadia, how are we? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty good. We were going to have this wonderful conversation because we've been waiting for, I don't know how many years it feels this conversation <laughs> it has been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> not not saying it's your fault, but I'm just saying it's not my yeah. fault. Okay. Yeah, it probably was my fault to be honest. <laughs> I had my own stuff going on. <laughs> no worries. We won't get into that, but um we will get into a really interesting conversation um about identity politics. Um I, I wanna preface this by saying that uh, I mean, as if I need to say this for, for a person who's done about 140 podcasts, like I have a number of different people on that I sometimes disagree with. And it may be the mm. case that we disagree. It may be the case that we agree uh, wholeheartedly. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into um, the actual specifics of the conversation later on. So mm. where, do you, where do you actually stand? Where, where's your... like? vested interest in this conversation how did you get to get into identity politics and how did you get interested in it I should say uh I guess it just it just happened naturally over time um my first kind of um my first experience of it was through the Labour Party actually um hmm. when I uh, started becoming involved in politics um uh because of my work in the women's sector i reached out to it was around a it was around an, an election an upcoming election i think it was the 2015 election um so just before the election i started getting in touch with all the political parties and saying look the election's coming up the situation for women's services locally in our area is really dire what can you do for us um in the women's sector and obviously are we t- talking about your response to our local organisations? Um, I, I got fobbed off by the Tory party um, at that time. Um, but then I got I got good response initially from the Labour Party. Now, I'm not massively, at that time I wasn't massively political. I became a little bit more political with time, but at that time I wasn't political at all. Um, uh, some of the issues that I was uh, talking about and dealing with were highly politicised, but I myself wasn't that political. Um, my partner, on the other hand, he's he, he was he was far more political and he was far more knowledgeable than I was. Um, and we had both been going to Labour Party sort of meetings and events and stuff like that, not regularly, but we went to enough. Um, And it was interesting that the Labour Party um, almost recruited me to be a councillor for the party. Mm. And even at the time, I I remember saying to my partner, I don't think this is this is genuine. Like it, I I was so aware that they that I was a tick box exercise. I was brown. I was female. Mm. They thought I was Muslim as well, which I'm not. 
And I knew for a fact that my partner was in a much, much stronger place and a much more competent place to, to run as counsellor than I was. Um, so that was kind of like my first proper um, experience of like the negatives uh, of, of identity politics. Equally also um, having worked in London for a little while um, in the atheist sector, I, f I feel like I got quite a lot of experience through that as well. The atheist community tends to harp on about identity politics quite a lot as if they're against it. Actually, they're not they're very very identitarian themselves as well what the, what the reason they harp on about it is because their identity isn't accepted amongst the identity politics sort of brigade usually they're just as likely to harp on about identity so i live i live in the west country uh, i live in the southwest um and here apart from when i had the the kind of dealings with the labor party Nobody really talks to me about my race. Nobody talks to me about my belief or lack of. Nobody talks to me about even about my sex. I do work in uh, women's services. So I have, uh, I, ha I kind of have a, an input in that way. And I talk about violence against women, but usually it's not a massive part of my life. However, working within the atheist community, I definitely felt like it was obsessed over you know, your race, mm. your sex, your either your religion or your lack of. And it, to me, I find it quite boring because it's the least interesting thing about a person. So when I talk to somebody, <laughs> what I want to know is what they do for a living, possibly where they live, just because that's a natural question to ask, what their interests are, possibly what their music taste is, what kind of food they like. Those are the interesting things about a person. I don't give a flying fig about what what you know about their characteristics about the obvious stuff or some of the the unobvious stuff that people have started talking about it's just so boring if <laughs> and in the atheist community the, the interesting thing is that they're, they're they're obsessing continuously about what they're not i just find that really yes like that's all you're talking about it's kind of boring actually like how many times can you talk about the same thing um, so that's sort of my experience about of identity politics in a nutshell. Like I was involved in the kind of ex-Muslim arena and for a long time I'd been saying I don't like that term because even within the atheist community it's kind of divisive, it's very identity politics sort of driven in itself. Um, but like I said, it, it, your identity, your characteristic, your characteristics are the least interesting things about you. It's who you who you are beyond that, what you do for a living, what your interests are that interest me genuinely. Absolutely. You're going to love my, my next few sentences. Um, I, <laughs> I, I do agree with you in terms of the amount of people who are apostates within the atheist community that seem to want for a very good reason to have a community. Mm. And... Uh, you know, they, they've been shunned by their family or whatever. It's completely understandable. But they then end up having uh, an in-group bias um, yes, towards anyone who's particularly atheist. So I threw out a tweet, probably my, my most responded to tweet the other day. And all it was was a tweet that said, describe your identity in a tweet. And that was mm -hmm. all, it, all it was. I think that I'm not trying to provoke people or not trying to offend anyone like how could anyone be possibly be offended right wrong well in um, your world, everybody's offended by everything it's just <laughs> yeah we're, we're living in very strange times to be honest can you guess some of the more common responses i got <laughs> i wouldn't like to hazard a guess go on <laughs> so the two most common <laughs> responses were um they were describing themselves as me so i'm, I'm just me um mm. which is sort of i mean i could it doesn't really explain anything but i could sort of understand where that comes from and then a load of other people were replying no or no full stop and it reminds me of that ricky gervais bit where he um he's, he's talking about twitter and he ends up saying, like, there's a person walking along, there's a town hall, there's a big uh, sign, 
and it says guitar lessons on it. So they pick it up and say, like, I don't want guitar lessons. Like, oh, just yeah. walk away. Walk away. It's not for yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. But they felt the need yeah. to respond to the tweet. Like, yeah. I would yeah. say I'm probably something along the lines of a podcaster, bitch gamer, conference organizer, author, as I keep banging on about, you know, that's what defines me personally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, had I come across that tweet, um, I, I because I don't want to talk about identity, quite, quite honestly, I would have just scrolled past it. That is what we do. If you're a sensible adult, I think sadly it is full of, I mean, it is a bit of a cesspit really, isn't it? I think again, Ricky Gervais described it perfectly that it's the, the toilet wall on the internet, isn't it? And who cares what people's opinions are on there? It's, it's, it's interesting because I think, like I kind of use it as a, a I do use Twitter, um, but I, I do, I'm also very aware that my opinion isn't very important. Why should it be to anybody at all, ever? Um, it's just one of those things that's kind of become a, a, a part of a part of life. But I, I don't, I don't treat it with any seriousness. I certainly engage with like political parties. And one of the things that I've tried to do um, recently, uh, actually probably about a year ago now, I started intentionally following all the political parties in the UK, started following mm. all the, um, uh, like all news outlets in the UK. Um, and it's interesting what happened. My All of my Twitter feed became quite conservative. And I thought before that, Because I have, to my shame, uh, and I am quite embarrassed about it, actually, and I don't really know what to do about it, I'm sure you'll tell me, but I have been that kind of um, social justice warrior in the past and uh, and kind of fell into the... How dare you? But there was was a lot that recently made me really rethink uh, just everything, I would say. So the first instance was being part... I joined the atheist community in a way for lots of reasons it wasn't one reason you know it was one of the major reasons was a personal sort of uh, um a thing that happened in my life that led me to join um but it was great i thought this is a platform for free speech they really really genuinely care about free speech no they don't they care about their speech that's the crucial thing to remember about the atheist community because and I found this within just the, the the kind of group that I was in. I'd been I'd been um, kicked off Twitter a few times for um, the Islamophobic tweets, and it was interesting because all of yeah. the, the kind of atheist friends would would jump on that and you know free speech da da da. It, this is this is ri- ridiculous, and I'd get reinstated, and then I got blocked for a transphobic tweet, an allegedly transphobic tweet. Um, and silence from my atheist friends, nothing at all. Uh, and I was blocked for quite a while, actually, for a couple of months, it might have even been three months. Um, and silence, and I realized at that point that there's a lot of hypocrisy within the atheist community as well. Um, for for um, a sector that champions apostasy, they actually are really, really hypocritical themselves. So. Uh, the atheist sector is largely left wing and I, you know I, I wouldn't say I'm that style of left wing anymore I'm still partially left uh, I, I'm a social democrat um, so I'm socially conservative I think about family and community and um, uh, and such is important um, and <laughs> but if you if you apostatize from the left the, these champions of apostasy will kick you out. I mean, I haven't even, I haven't ventured all the way over to conservative. I don't have a problem with conservatives. I used to when I when I was a bit of a, um, you know, a, a moronic, ignorant lefty, um, a, a childish lefty, I should say, which I think a lot of uh, a lot of the atheist community is. But um, what I found was anybody that was uh, say an atheist, uh, a minority that, you know, I was working in with minority atheists um, and a conservative, 
would instantly be apostatized from like they would be forcefully apost. It was it was almost like blasphemy for them, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a right wing or a conservative um, uh, atheist. They they wouldn't extend support to them in the same way, which was all very very. Um, very interesting as well. So I, I, I have a lot of complaints with that that sector now. Yeah, it's a good, it's, uh, it's good to go over definitions of words. Brian in the comments says uh, agnostic, pointing towards himself. Bloody fence sitter. Um, but apart from you know, there's no there's no stigma here. We don't we don't do that. Um, but uh, <laughs> hello Ashley Fortenberry as well. I haven't seen you around. Hello to you, cafe well and all sorts of lovely people if you do have questions for um Dahlia, then uh, feel free to throw them down in the live chat and tag me uh, because then i can ask them straight away i think i've managed to fix nightbot as well so uh yeah i, I to, to add to what you're you're saying i do think there is a degree of hypocrisy i don't think it's intentional i just don't think people have had enough time to think it through and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely ignorant on these things, and that's fine. But it's, I think the bottom line is having these conversations and being able to express oneself openly is the the, the main crux of um, the, the problem. Because there's anybody who, there, oh, there's some people that I would define as uh, the there's the irrational left, and these the, there's the rational left, and I would consider myself part of the rational left, and I would consider the people that you're talking about the irrational left, the fringe that's ruining it for, for the rest of us. Yeah, and sadly, they are, although they are a minority, and they are actually, you know, there's a lot more sensible people than there are the, these kind of hysterical nut jobs, to be quite frank. Um, sadly, because they're the loudest, and this has always happened, I've noticed it even within... The, the kind of religious community that I was formerly a part of as well, um, the, the kind of more fundamentalist characters, they, they might be small in numbers, but they're the most vocal, they make themselves noticed, they're the ones that get approached for everything, so it really tarnishes, you know, the whole community, and I think that's happening in lots of segments of society, sadly. Um, I think what's more important now, and I did find this in, in a political party that I joined, um, like I said, the Social Democrats, they're fantastic, um, that they that they don't focus on, they don't obsess about the identity issues. They want to, they want to focus on community and togetherness and unity rather than division. Um, and they won't, they, you know, they're not, they're not trying to pit people against one another. I genuinely feel like left-wing political parties, particularly uh, the Labour Party uh, and uh, in some smaller uh, left-wing parties, their politics are very, very divisive. It's interesting, isn't it? Like, uh, whilst racism has been decreasing, that they've been increasing the funding and resources and the, the kind of hysteria around racism in the country, whilst class divides are growing and classism is becoming more of a serious issue, the funding, the resources, the discussions, the activism, or all, all of that around class has almost vanished. Um, so it, it, I think class is a, a more complex issues so they're not willing to discuss it again the social democrats are willing to discuss it so that's where i found a home um all of the kind of sensible left-wing issues that i want to to see uh being dealt with are being dealt with there i mentioned uh akala to andisa thomas who was on a couple of weeks ago i don't know um as a slight s side note that is a massive wine glass <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, I like my glasses, whether it's teacups or glasses, to be about the size of my face. So, <laughs> so yeah. we should. Peter Bogosian always says um, to address the distractions in a conversation, so I did. To which I've now forgotten <laughs> what I was going to say. Um, but there we are. Um, there's a plethora of comments coming through, um, none of them with me tagged in them. Um, although there are um, some coming through. Brian. I crack crack him up apparently. Uh, Cafe, thanks for the shout out. Um, Brian says uh, I'm awesome, uh, and so are his guests. So at least people are enjoying it. Um, so when it comes to your, and I, and I won't go into your own 
background and, and that sort of thing but you've you've come out of a particular place and then you've f tried to find community and you've gone into the labor party as you said and they ended up mm -hmm. trying to end up identifying people that were part of what would be considered um intersectional minorities i guess so you would be a um black young woman who ends up you know you tick box as you you said you, you fulfill yeah. certain criteria so what's what's the response to that what's the i would i would say cure that because that's i mean so nobody should end up getting a position just because of who they are or, or what no. they are because otherwise no. then that discriminates against people such as myself who would then you know i came from hayes in west london you know i have a degree of privilege especially when it comes to being white obviously and i have had no say over that whatsoever and to acknowledge that i acknowledge do i do i would say i do uh given you know comparing myself to the rest of the planet at least then yes <laughs> but is again it, my, my, there, there is an assumption my sorry been, my partner's okay. just finished his phd and he's trying to get in a job in academia um and because academia is a cesspit of identity politics at present um he's not gonna he's not gonna get a job he looks from the outside wow. like a white middle class man um however he doesn't have a job he doesn't have an income um you know he's not it, I, I think this whole privilege thing is a bit of a fallacy you know if uh, um if i had okay. grown up in say hampstead and gone to the same schools as some of the the the, the white kids there i would have white privilege as well wouldn't i what is what is this potentially privilege discussion that we're that we're having i i don't think so because i think class and money and contacts do matter um uh, and uh, uh, interestingly i was talking to a friend of mine who's a bbc journalist um i won't mention her name for her own safety <laughs> not, it's not white men that are holding her back it's brown men brown wealthy men that are holding her back that every time she goes to go to to do a job it's you know someone uh someone like what's the channel 4 news guy uh can't remember his name Krishna Guru yeah, yeah. yeah so he's there beforehand because he's got the name he's got the fame he's got the he's got the status right so she, her complaint was it wasn't white men it was brown men brown wealthy men that are holding her back because right now he's got that privilege so it's it's a bit more I think reducing it down to white privilege just it oversimplifies something that's actually quite complex. Mm. Um, I, I'm not I'm not convinced by by that that at all. Because if that was the case, every white man would have a job, and every brown female wouldn't have a job. It's just not that simple. It's just not. Yeah. I, I think it's just ingenuous to reduce it down to that. And I think that again creates more more division, really. Because now we've, we're starting to pit people against one another on the basis of, of their race plus privilege. It just, it just doesn't Correct. make sense. No, I agree. I agree on that specific point. What I, I mean by my own privileges is that um, a certain amount of crime, let's say in, in London, gets done by white people. But the, the statistics are skewed in terms of stop and search in favour of you know, stopping black people. So I'm benefiting in that respect because i don't know whether could it be considered that i'm benefiting from being white in that respect i'm being given a status as if oh i'm being treated like i'm better than i i mean i am i am good i'm not one of the people that's causing any of these issues but you get what i mean like that i it might be considered that black people are being adversely affected and as such i am fe feeling the opposite i think uh... I think it depends on what you I don't have the statistics in front of me or the facts yeah, and things worry. in front of me. <laughs> the sort of, you know, I can't can't talk about this as if I have any kind of authority in the arena. Um, but to be quite honest, if I was a police officer, if I saw somebody who looked a bit dodgy, regardless of their skin colour, 
I would go and do my job. That's the kind of basic that you can that you can ask for. I think one of the problems that I have um, in this discussion is what's being asked for often by um, particularly now in the current times that we're in is that that minorities shouldn't be policed at all. I'm sorry, I don't agree because it, there is this issue of um, you know minorities harming other minorities. So, for example, if we just just to talk about the brown community for a moment, honor crimes that happen within BME uh, like mm. th within brown communities, right? I've been harping on for a really long time to social workers, to um, teachers, to um, police officers, healthcare workers that what I want you to do is forget about the colour of the person that you're talking to and just apply the law as if you would do in a case that were that involved a white parent abusing a white child. Excuse me. So what ends up happening is that the, the the professionals involved in those cases end up wanting to have discussions about race and religion when that's got nothing to do with the issue at hand. This is the law. This is harm being done to a child by a parent. What has their cultural religion got to do with it? Why are you having that discussion to me? That is racism. So in exactly the same way, right. if you see something that looks a bit dodgy, like. If, if you see a black man walking down the street in a suit or like, you know, well-dressed, well-behaved, you're not going to approach that black man. But if you see a black man walking down the streets that looks like he's, you know, a little bit, a little bit suspect. Um, over you're going to stop. Yeah, the police has got to, the police has got to be able to do their job and apply the law equally to all citizens and all residents. And that's, um, I think that's, that, that, that has to have, not doing that to me, is racist to say that we're going to police one community one way and another community another way well then then you that that's the institution telling that community that that, that you know you're not proper proper citizens in this country um I, I i don't think it's fair to ask for no policing or you know different policing for a different community it just doesn't make sense well, that's a great point to go into. Where is it? In uh, is it Minneapolis, somewhere like mm -hmm. that, where they're trialing a like a they're trying to get rid of the police or something like that? Because community policing mm -hmm. is is being proposed, and I'm not from what I've heard, I'm not a fan. Um, <laughs> it just won't work. What? Yeah. What do you make of the whole way in which the the whole Black Lives Matter issue has been addressed or a failure to be addressed? Has, has occurred over the past few weeks? So, I mean, from because of the Black Lives Matter, uh, I don't want to even call them protests because they've been really quite extreme. Um, Riots, if you yeah. yeah, because of what they've been doing, they have made some changes. Um, so I think that they deserve a bit of credit for that. You know, they're, they're, they're talking about not allowing police officers to put their put, put uh, pressure on somebody's neck I think that's good I haven't liked their tactics at all um uh, I don't believe in violent protests I think it doesn't achieve anything and actually you lose quite a lot of sympathy um I think also that that um I don't appreciate dishonesty in in campaigning and activism you know using half truths or using kind of like a fraction of a of a fact um what happened with George Floyd was hideous um, nobody can deny that. I haven't heard anyone say that that that, that was a good thing. But, and if if you do come across someone like that, you'd probably think that they were very very um, mentally unwell. unwell. Um, uh, and they would probably, you know, they would probably belong in some kind of institution. Um, I, I I think that I think that the the way they went about it was pretty appalling actually and they were harming their own community as well you know for for a campaign that the, whose slogan is black lives matter they didn't seem to matter in their behavior you know there were there were members of the black community coming out and saying you're destroying our community we live here for crying out loud um so there was there was that i don't believe in toppling statues i think that's a a, a disgusting thing to do as well um certainly some sensible discussion around that needed to happen too um i think that um the way that 
the way that things were happening. And I saw this video, um, a, a, a police officer had, I think it was a police officer that had recorded it, saw it on TikTok. Um, <laughs> I know, I sh it's, a, it's a shameful- Don't worry, we don't fact check confession here, it's fine. <laughs> confession to make, but I, I, do, I do like TikTok, it's really silly and just really, uh, the like nice kind of relax, not relaxing, but silly videos, which I like. But I came across this video on TikTok and they were saying that that police station that they burnt down in that police station, and this was something close to my heart because I care about sexual violence sort of issue. Um, hundreds and th hundreds, hun hundreds, possibly thousands of evidence um, uh, samples had burnt down witness statements mm. uh, from sexual violence victims because that police station had been burnt down. They hadn't just burnt down an institution, they had burnt down quite a lot of the good work that they did as well, which made me think that, yes, this isn't the way to do things, you know. Um, and I think the thing that we've missed here is uh, the, the discussions, the general discussion about police brutality the general discussion about how the police officers are recruited, having a register where police officers that aren't good, um, you know, that have done uh, terrible things, they can't just leave one police force and go to another police force. Um, there was lots of sensible discussions that, that should have been happening that I don't think have, because police brutality doesn't just affect black people in, in at the US, it also affects white people. Um, uh, I, th I think a lot of the facts and figures are coming out and I can quote them off offhand, but I've seen quite a lot of the facts and figures come out. Um, so it, it, I think, like I said, I, I see what happened as awful. However, I heard somebody say that it could have been racially motivated, but we don't know if it was racially motivated and saying that it was racially motivated, when when we don't know it, it is is a bit of a problem um you know there's certain things that certain investigations that need to go on to give us that information so that we can work off the basis of that which didn't happen and i think this is my problem with activism actually the activism tends to be uh emotion led rather than evidence led um right. and hysterical rather than sort of reasoned and uh, and sort of proportionate uh, uh, and I, I don't I don't agree with that yeah there's an amount of tweets that you uh, probably haven't noticed from me you'll love them all um everyone could uh, down in the description you'll find my twitter um I, I put out a what is admittedly a badly worded tweet and I deleted it and my my whole point with that particular tweet that I'm referring to was that I was trying to say this fringe over here is ruining it for the bigger group, right? Yeah. And um, I got certain responses, again, you'll love this, from one or two people who ended up um, saying, oh, it wouldn't be so bad if we smashed up a few town halls. Now, Okay, there's very interesting discussion to be had, and it led to a, a later poll I put up saying, uh, what's better, violent protests or peaceful protests? And it came out just in favour of peace. Um, but it wasn't by much. And I, a sample size, maybe 100 people, but it's still, that's a lot of people. That's still like 40, 50 people that are following me that are in favour of violent protest over peaceful protest. So that was interesting. Um, I... To be honest, I think um, Rene, Renevelation, Rene who was on the channel, I don't know how long ago, a dozen podcasts ago, uh, nailed it when he said, in the long run, peaceful protest will change people's hearts and minds, and eventually that brings about change. But if you're uh, advocating for a more violent protest, then um, that ultimately damages your cause. Um, I mean, yeah. you're nodding, so <laughs> we don't need to really elaborate. But no, you just lose sympathy very, very quickly. Um, but if you, it, it, it's the protests just they win over hearts, they win over minds. It changes everything. The, on on the kind of issue of uh, 
toppling statues, which, you know, I'm absolutely disgusted by Sadiq Khan actually creating some kind of, um, you know, body to review what statues should and shouldn't remain uh, uh, erected in our, in our um, capital. Um, you know who does that, right? It's the fundamentalists and the, the terrorists and the jihadis that do stuff like that. Whenever ISIS or, you know, Al-Qaeda or um, the Taliban, etc., have moved in, the very first thing they do is erase your history completely so that they can go, this was day dot, this started from here right now. We're putting our stamp on this and erasing everything before that. I think that's a... a a really dangerous thing to do. If you erase all of all of, if you erase all of history, I think, um, well, you you are very very likely to repeat it because things don't always move in the positive. You know, things aren't always moving towards progress. We go, so, you know, sometimes we ha take a step back and take two steps back. That's what I see happening right now. You know, that in the sense that you have these so-called left wingers. The, the so-called left-wing, you know, identitarian activists um, that are that are e sorry, my phone's going um, that are acting in the exact same way as the, the, you know fundamentalist jihadi groups. Um, I, I I I don't. I don't understand how people haven't realized that this is what's happening. I think also th this is the this is the true face of postmodernism coming out. You know, the postmodernism it, it, it has been the most grotesque thing to come out of academia. The fact that hi history is, you know, seen through like it's not a history isn't history it's our story as as we want it it's the most ridiculous story ridiculous thing to come out of ac academia and we're seeing the height of postmodernist garbage right now in what's going on around the world through these black lives matter protests and uh, and activities and activism or whatever one wants to call it so yeah i um I find it really interesting having loads of different perspectives on and um, on Thursday, I, I should say, I have uh, Rose of Dawn coming on. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah. So they are themselves trans, but they are gender critical. Um, yeah. And so they have um, an interesting segment on their channel. I don't know if they still do it called Trans Stupid and they, they go after trans people. Now, it's not for me to to jump in at this point because I have like I no vested interest in the conversation I just have a I, I think from my perspective I just want a load of different people with a load of different opinions coming on the podcast and then I can get a, a more rounded opinion rather than just having a particular perspective on the podcast because that's not really very interesting um so when it comes to uh trans as well which is a, like a as far as I can see it, it's, you know, people, people could do whatever they want. It really doesn't affect my life, right? But then there are certain um, parts of it which seem to be contradictory or seem to um, ruin it for the rest of the group. Say, a very obvious example, any trans person that ends up saying uh, you're transphobic if you don't want to date a trans person. Or you're not attracted to a trans person, or th those sorts of arguments. I would then say, say, you know what, I, I don't agree with that specific point, but I'll still advocate for your existence. You don't have to justify your existence to me. Yeah. You're, you know, you're still a human being. I'll still call you whatever name you like. I'll, I'll um, use your pronoun. Yeah, come. I think that's the issue that we're having now, though, that people think that if you disagree with them, that you 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 think that they shouldn't be alive or you think that they shouldn't have a a, a right to existence i think that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever heard there used to be something called debate i wonder if anybody's actually heard of that anymore it is ridiculous because this is what the trans activists and uh, i've seen this both in 
religious and irreligious communities as well that because people disagree with them they think that um that they don't have a right to exist which um is ludicrous um but i mean in terms of the kind of um you know sexual preferences that it's just that it's a preference if somebody tells me that they don't find me attractive i don't think that they're a bigot you do, it's just an additional tool that people have found to to kick off um i i kind of had a very um unattractive moment of my own once where i laid into a, a guy who was a trans activist he was um uh, yeah, and he was harping on about how um how, how racist the gay scene is and i was like it's not racist darling it's just because you can't get laid now you need a label for it <laughs> So, yeah, it was kind of a, it was an ugly moment for me because it was quite personal. But oh, he was so hysterical because somebody disagreed with him. That, and, and I guess this is the trouble, isn't it? If you start having these discussions with these hysterical people that do often get personal, it's very easy to to get personal in response. And I don't think it helps anybody. It doesn't help the conversation. So um, I'm all uh, you know, I'm hundred percent for free speech. But I think free speech also has something quite wonderful in it that everybody has a right to speak but everybody also has the right not to listen to you if they don't want to hear you they can just walk on by and let you carry on with your madness by yourself um so um you know free speech isn't also it doesn't also mean that everybody has to speak to everybody i i, I do think i let you let you have your public square wherever that is i don't believe in banning blocking or you know um or any of that kind of thing but i do think i do also have a right not to listen so if i'm not interested i will just get up and, and leave or not interact with that content and that's the way to deal with these debates i think um i think free speech activists tend to be quite selective in what speech they like and what speech they don't like. And that is me generalizing. I don't mean that about every spe free speech activist. I mean, free speech activists in the, in the a lot of free speech activists in the atheist movement uh, were, were like that, which was quite concerning actually. I went to uh, an old boys school. So you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine what it was like, what sort of things got said. Um, it's um, highly pent up kind of environment <laughs> where you're constantly trying to out offend one another so all sorts of language gets said yeah. and uh so i come from the particular background where i have absolute free speech and there are a whole number of offensive things that gets get said that i have a degree of resistance to whereas a lot yeah. of the atheist community as far as i can see are apostates where they have had religion um restrict their freedom of speech and they can't question anything they can't challenge anything and as such those two groups are coming head on and mm -hmm. it's not that i'm like you know there, there's people that are coming into the atheist community and then they're saying uh i thought this was a community for xyz it's like look yeah there's, there's the only thing that we have in common is that we don't believe something as you said at the st start yeah. And it's very but odd to, to identify. Say so that again, you dropped out. Of, Sorry. So it's a very weak basis to have a community on because it's a it's about what you don't. There's one thing you have in common that's that's your lack of any belief, and that's it. That's it. But the the thing also is that these communities that are formed that just like because they are largely left-wing sadly and i've never ever been part of a left-wing community that hasn't eaten itself and destroyed itself by itself from the inside out um uh, and that's what i see within the atheist community as well because a lot of the support and the solidarity and all of that kind of crap that they offer is conditional you know you have to be say open borders and if you're not open borders you're closed borders rather than somebody that says i want a sensible immigration policy which that, which is what i want you know i i don't i'm not open borders and i'm not closed borders i think we need a sensible discussion around immigration in the country um and it's interesting in in the atheist movement it's largely open borders because there's a lot of asylum related work that goes on within the atheist community as well saving people from countries where you could be murdered for you know executed for being an atheist um but it's we really are living in an age of age of extremes where people think that if you're not one you're the other rather than having this sensible center ground which actually most normal people do accommodate 
if you talk to a lot of people, they understand that grey area a lot better than the activist extremists that you see uh, on either side. So um, I guess that's that's kind of my problem. I don't like sitting in the extreme end of any anything anymore. And I think there's a time and a place for that when you're young and you're full of like hormonal kind of, you know, um, fire, you do end up accommodating one of those extremes if if you don't have that guidance as well um uh, but when you when you grow up you do kind of grow out of it but that's the thing some people don't grow out of it some people make that activism their life and i think that's another issue as well these the the the, the activism has now become a career it's become a profession a paid profession at that so what that means is that even if you start realizing that you're wrong or there's evidence that that contradicts your position well you're financially invested in you know accommodating that position for the rest of your life whereas when it was some when activism was something that you did in your spare time around your job um you could change your opinion uh, that, that's kind of my personal take on it i guess Speaking of being paid for activism, uh, YouTube Perks has just scrolled across the screen. Uh, for anyone who wants to join and use special emojis down in, in the live chat and help me out as well. Um, because obviously, pandemic um, has meant that not only am I out of working in schools, but I'm also uh, not able to get a grant from the government. So I'm not taking anything from taxpayers. So uh, yeah, please help. Um, but yeah, in in terms of the uh, the actual uh, identity politics of certain individuals i find that they can end up coming to what is the the false dichotomy uh, fallacy and so these people typically cannot have a nuanced conversation now as i, I previously mentioned peter because have you read his his um book how to have impossible conversations whose book sorry peter bogosian big orange book no um so in terms of what it says towards the end of the the book for more expert conversations it says that <clears throat> when you're talking to a fundamentalist they attach their beliefs to a part of their identity so if we're talking about a theist we're talking about somebody who is saying look if i take any other ideas I've become lesser as a person because I am yeah. I'm I believe that whatever I believe now is the optimum and actually there's yeah. we have to accept that in 10 years time we're going to look back and look at what we believe now and I'm going to look back at the the quality of this podcast I'm going to think oh what the bloody hell was I doing you know <laughs> this audio wasn't this that or the other or whatever but it, it, you get my point so uh, yeah in terms of trying to wade through the discussion and encourage people to just so much as to talk is so yeah. difficult i think that we need to have the ability and i've said it before and i will say it again on this podcast we need to look at ourselves and say do i have the ability to sit down with a white supremacist and change their mind yeah because i have and that in my control and my power so I yeah, and humanize them, right? So uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dia Khan, made two documentaries and she sat with two groups of men for two separate documentaries that were really quite scary to her. One was the jihadis that she sat with, uh, actually ex-jihadis, ex thankfully, um, the kind of people that, you know, chased her out of her own home and her own country. Um and she she spoke to them like humans and now they're friends um and then she did the same with some uh neo-nazis in the us um and actually because of the conversations she had with them because and she has got a lovely demeanor she's got she's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet there's nobody that she couldn't turn into a you know a fluffy bunny by the end of her conversation with them um uh you know that he he left his group and he he he's now an activist against you know um neo-nazism um so 
if part of what the, the recruiters of these both the jihadi groups and the neo-nazis and that kind of uh you know um th those kind of extremists part of what they do is they dehumanize the people that you're supposed to hate and how how we how we can destroy those movements is by rehumanizing the people that they that they've been telling you to hate on um sometimes it is sitting in a room with someone that you're absolutely terrified of and going let's let's have this chat as as two people that are on the same page that are equals you know and not taking a moral high ground i think the left is particularly good at this actually of taking the moral high ground that because i'm a left winger i'm i'm you know up here and because you don't agree with me on everything then you you basically are scum um I, I, and that you know i remember the last the last election in december one of my biggest complaints from the Labour Party was the way they spoke to people that would usually be their vote bank. Working class communities, they speak to them with absolute contempt, absolute contempt. And I went to two, I went to two hustings locally um, and the second one that I was going to, uh, I ended up talking to a couple of Labour Party activists that were lost and I was like, you follow me, I'm going there as well. And they said, who are you voting for? And I said, to be honest, I don't know, because the party that I wanted to vote for wasn't standing locally, the SDP. Um, I, says, I just said, to me, they're all wankers, to be honest, they're all exactly the same. Um, and uh, th their faces just contorted with absolute disgust towards me. And I thought, well, yeah, you're gonna win me over like that, aren't you? Because now I would rather vote Tory than vote for you. Thank you very much. Because at least they don't give me that face when I tell them that they're doing it wrong. Um, but this is the thing, they don't actually know how to talk to people anymore. They know how to talk to Ash Sarkar. Uh, they know how to talk to Owen Jones, because quite frankly, they are wiping their backsides for them, but they don't know how to talk to normal people with very, very real grievances, with very, very real issues. Um, so I think that I quite, I kind of want to see the Labour Party vanish because I don't think we've got a proper opposition in this country anymore. We, we have got a single party country because of the way our voting system works because of the fact that the Labour Party don't actually talk about any issues that affect normal people. They're so uh, focused on identity issues and not, you know, economic issues, for instance, or, uh, you know, community or so, like the social issues that actually matter. We haven't got an opposition. It, it, it's a, we haven't got an opposition at all. So I'm gonna go down into the live chat in just a second. On that point, what do you make of Keir Starmer? Yeah. Oh, he's so boring. <laughs> he's so boring. I mean, I didn't like Corbyn at all, but at least there was a little bit of excitement there. He was he was crap. <laughs> Corbyn was actually definitely crap, but like it was something to get like you know that it was it was like watching an interesting drama series. Keir Starmer just uh, yeah, I don't think he's going to do anything spectacular to be honest. Um, he's just boring i know he's done some good work in the past um he was um like i've got a, a friend who's a lawyer and he was saying he was quite he was quite key in terms of the grooming gang stuff getting that sort of stuff started and getting the ball rolling on that um but other than that i don't think he's going to do anything particularly exciting i don't think he has done anything particularly exciting and i think it was a big kick in the it making nashar um, the the sec I think he he made a shadow secretary for communities and community cohesion or something like that. One of the most d d divisive um, Labour Party politicians that that you know she. Do you remember she retweeted something from a from it was like a joke Twitter account, uh, like a fake Owen Jones account that said or. White, white girls should shut up about the all white grooming gang victims should shut up about the 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 rape and sexual violence that they had endured, so as not to provoke racial tensions or something like that. He made her, she retweeted that, and he made her, you know, shadow secretary secretary for community co cohesion. So I just, I I just I just 
I can't see anything changing. And also, they're not really listening, are they? Have they gone out and spoken to, uh, I realise it's in the middle of COVID and it probably isn't realistic right now, but they have to go out door knocking now. If they do it five minutes before a general election, people just think, get lost. We know you don't care about us. You, you've never come and spoken to us about the issues that are affecting us. So this is fake. This is because you want our vote right now. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not convinced so far, to be honest. Interesting. Um, the discussion will continue. Uh, Brian, hello. You can become my um, second YouTube member. Um, and as such, um, I think I can now add more emojis. The more people that end up becoming members, I, the more emojis I get to add. And I want people to have a degree of control over what they actually want to have as their emojis. If you want to make, you know, some giant penis with my face on it or something, to at least suggest it. I may not make it. I may not make it, uh, but it's at least a suggestion. Um, so your suggestions are more than welcome. Get in touch. Uh, Mars, hello to you. Uh, I must get Mars on at some point. Um, question for Sadia. Humans are tribal and we drive to activist causes that cater to our senses, not to rationalism. If activism becomes a mob, how can rationalism be reintroduced to an angry crowd? Uh, uh, I, I think I'm probably um, not informed enough to answer something like that. I wouldn't go into a mob. I'm certainly, I would certainly talk to individuals that are responsible for leading those mobs. Um, but I think an angry mob is, isn't a safe environment for anyone, including that very mob. Um, interestingly, actually, something that I didn't mention was when this all started, particularly in London, because it didn't really make sense to me why this was happening in London uh, and in, in the UK. It makes sense, um, even though I don't agree with their tactics, that reaction still made a sense in, in the US, but it didn't make sense here talking of mobs it made me think of um there was a mob lynching of Mishal khan in pakistan um who was accused he was falsely accused of blaspheming in pakistan um mm. and it was unthinking you know baseless um there was no evidence for it whatsoever in fact in, fa in fact after it happened the evidence came out that the, the, the blasphemy claim had been fabricated uh, because he'd made some cl complaints against the university administrators. Um, and that's what it made me think of, this kind of unthinking, um, you know, bloodthirsty mob. Um, and I thought, we're not that kind of a country. We're not America. We're just not. To, to try and import US sort of racial politics into the UK is very dishonest because we're not that kind of country. We're not a, an extremist sort of country. We didn't go for, you know, free market fundamentalism or, 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 um, or, or like, you know, um, communism. We're just not that kind of country. So to have a reaction like this in the UK, um, it just made me feel like we're, we're kind of, descending into madness we're not it's just it's not our identity it's not who we are like I know I know the kind of moronic identity politics um and postmodernists will will say that we Britain doesn't have an identity but it very much does we do have our own sort of unique identity um you know the kind of uh, <laughs> I remember when uh, when I first started dating my partner we, we were we his family are quite middle class themselves like his mum's middle class his dad's working class and they are quite a middle class family um now but they were talking about how people don't talk about politics and religion at the dinner table you know there's kind of we have we have certain things that we do we we, we like to go out for tea cake and stuff like that you know we love our gardens there's so much there's so much lovely british culture to kind of try and erase that so that we can import something that that is that isn't one isn't us and two i think is inferior you know is, is uh, it just worries me it worries me that we're trying to import that kind of uh, racial politics to to this country when it's not our politics it just isn't 
we've never been that I, and I, I'm quite proud of that um but yeah sorry go, going back to the question I, I wouldn't know how to engage with the mob I don't think it'd be safe or sensible look at our police they're not being able to deal with the mob um so I, I don't know what hope there is for you know us puny humans <laughs> I think uh, the way I would answer that is just one step at a time if this isn't going to happen very quickly it's going to be a very late avalanche if it ever becomes an avalanche back to the left and so uh i mean it eventually will obviously we'll, we'll eventually have a change of government but um it's going to be conservative for quite a while i was saying this yesterday to um dick dawson so yeah it's um it's, it's uh, quite frustrating actually given that i have identified as left for a very long time to then see so many people i should be getting along with dismissing me as you know, over towards the right and it's like maybe compared to to you but, <laughs> but no yeah, but it's interesting because i think what it actually and it, like i said going back to something that i said earlier you know the moment i started following and it wasn't because uh, my political politics had shifted i just thought i need to be i can't just form an opinion by looking at one side of the discussion that's not healthy that's not even sensible um by broadening out the, the the people just it was just a small thing to do broadening out the people that i follow on twitter the, the political parties the the kind of news outlets etc my twitter shifted to the right sadly i think that the left now is about only being part of an echo chamber that you know reinforces what you're saying and what you believe rather than engaging with anything other than you, you know anything different and a good example of that was when owen jones tweeted saying about um some a, a, a problematic book on on somebody's bookshelf um it, it shows that that side the left actually own they, they're very very um they're very very um uh, controlling about what th their tribe can can interact with which is really dangerous i was told that i was um <laughs> becoming far right because i retweeted a daily mail article and the daily mail isn't far right it's cons it's center right but it's not far right i might and it might uh, it wasn't because I have any love for the Daily Mail. It's just an interesting article. It doesn't mean that my politics have shifted to that way. But this is it. I think, um, it, uh, and this is interesting too. I, I, I think that the right are more likely to interact with left wing material, and the left are never going to interact with right wing material. I think that they're too, mm. um, they're too controlling. They're too domineering. To me, they they come across as you know, like having. <laughs> having worked in like domestic abuse and sexual violence sort of uh, arenas, they come across as an abusive perpetrator, actually being very controlling of what you can do, who you can interact with, you know, what you can say. This sounds like an abusive relationship, actually. Um, so <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very unhealthy. The left is very, very unhealthy and they actually make people unwell. What we're seeing with the behavior of people on the left is the behavior of people that are quite unwell you don't do that kind of thing if you're if you're you know mentally stable i think i think um it's well worth saying because i haven't mentioned it yet i i used to past tense used to uh stand for the greens locally um it's not that i you know don't s swing towards that direction still it's that i don't i i have a uh, a hankering towards more independent politics now mm. in the sense that I can objectively just stand back and look at everyone and engage with everyone and then say I agree with this specific thing I disagree with this specific thing and I tend yeah. to agree with more things towards the left than I do with the right so I, I, yeah I, th I think over the past few years I have become much better at trying to as you said, humanise and try to 
engage with certain people that I do disagree with. Uh, a very good example, people will know on this this podcast that are regulars, I've, I think I've had more Brexit voters than I've had Remainers on, and I am myself a Remainer. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've never raised my voice at people uh, have just yeah. having so much as a conversation because, again, the conversation is so important to have. It's better. Do you want you know fisticuffs in the streets, or do you want a conversation? Like, <laughs> I prefer to have the conversation. Um, we did, um, or rather, you did mention uh, some of the work you do. Um, so, what actually is it that you do? As opposed, uh, I wouldn't describe it as activism because you you sort of refraining from calling it activism. But yeah, what is it you actually do? So I I have um, it's it's. Uh what's known as a second tier women's organization. So I provide training, um, information uh, and support to organizations around working on harmful traditional practices. So things like honor crimes, forced marriage, FGM, um, child marriage, um, dowry related abuse, sexual violence, stuff like that. So um, that's sort of what I've done for almost a decade now. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's like a quick roundup uh um and also uh kind of trying to venture out into integration because i think what we've got wrong in this country quite seriously wrong actually is that um what we what we what we started doing was pigeonholing members of different communities into kind of very um kind of you know uh definitive boxes and even within that so what's ended up happening is minorities that don't fit that box are often attacked from within that minority box and also outside. Um, we also have a, a country where people are very, very divided in the sense that we might be living together, but we actually don't know anything about each other. Um, I think we really, really need, uh, uh, and I've been arguing for it for almost a decade as well, actually, as long as I've been in the women's sector, I've been arguing for um, an integration policy for uh, the country. Um, uh, so, so that's part of, uh, that's a piece of work that I've started doing now as well. Um, uh, and also something, I'm starting something around free speech, uh, hopefully soon with a, with a few partner partners from around the world, um, which is in process, process at the moment. It's going to take a little while to get set up. But yeah, that's kind of everything. Everything apart from some of the um, my, my notes. That is, do you do um, pack atheists with Ali? We had uh, Ali on. I don't know how long ago, a few, few months ago, before the pandemic, um, and he's still getting a fair few views as well for that podcast. I don't mm. know whether it's just because you know it, it, you strike something in the algorithm that ends up getting a certain amount of hate um i'm sure that that's the case um not given the number of dislikes on it but yeah what actually is pack atheist because uh i watch it sometimes it's and then he'll, he'll be talking a little bit in english and then he'll just go into like urdu or something and then just say like yeah. one word in english like he's trying to troll me just like I, <laughs> you white man don't understand these <laughs> bloody um, languages so it, was, oh. it was a youtube channel um and it so it, bark has kind of a couple of uh, meanings. Bark uh, is, um, it means pure, uh, uh, but also because, because atheists are also considered um, impure. It was kind of a, a bit, bit of a play on words. It was a pure atheist YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and it was just, Basically, it was just so that I we could rant about stuff. Uh, I, I've done less of it for a little while, actually, because, as I said, like I, I think it's um, to to base something on something that you're not is counterproductive. I think this is the the tough thing as well, actually, because I've done quite a lot in the last few years uh, that has been a bit more public, uh, and I have changed my mind publicly quite a lot as well. Uh, so it makes it harder, I think. Like, I don't actually um, think it's that important part, that much of an important part of my identity saying that at the same time. You know, I spoke to um, three Pakistani atheists today that were like, we really need, we really need help right now. 
Um, so yeah, it's complicated, um, uh, but I think the broader kind of, dealing with the broader issues is more important than, than the kind of identity-based issues. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just a YouTube channel, but it's not really, it's nothing really major. <laughs> It's well worth subscribing to just to be mind fucked into, you know, foreign <laughs> languages in the Middle East. Yeah, um, I, get, yeah. I get bored because I speak Punjabi and uh, there's a bit of an arrogance uh, in, in Pakistan um, about uh, Punjabi. So Punjabi is considered um, the kind of language of the lower classes and the illiterate and the uneducated um so it's slowly being erased so if you speak Urdu, you're considered like higher class um so th th there's that kind of dynamic as well um and and literate and you know a bit posher um but i grew up speaking punjabi here born and raised here and, and spoke punjabi here um so it's, it's it's complicated but i i i you know i quite like being able to speak uh, all the languages and and mess about with it i try and put some videos up in english as well so I think that's important too. Um, uh, and I talk, I tend not to focus just on religion. I focus on, look, at if I'm interested in something, I'll make a video about it and pop it up, uh, sometimes in English and sometimes in other, um, like Urdu or Punjabi. Um, uh, and Ali likes to focus on the kind of religious element uh, more so. Yeah, I tend to not go into the religious so much. Yeah, I'm far more interested in the futurism and the politics and all that. Um, yeah. What I wanted to know is, I've been going back and forth on this channel as to whether I can even so much as be asked to go through all the podcasts and add subtitles to then be able to tap like Arabic options and things like that, just to yeah. try and make this content more available to that part of the world, especially when it can trigger something in the algorithm because there, that's that's the part of a community that is being neglected somewhat um but am i necessarily the best person to be able to to actually provide those um languages and though that sort of feeder should i just leave it to those communities themselves to just come up and do their own stuff no i mean this goes back to what we were just talking about um i genuinely believe that anybody can talk about anything you know just because i have a vagina doesn't mean i should be the only one talking about periods or you know pregnancy or um uh, and I do believe in women only spaces as well because that was something that was really really hard fought for oh yeah um it's complex you know for I don't believe in sex segregation and forced sex segregation but sometimes I do think women only spaces are crucial but in terms of talking about things I don't think anybody should be prevented about talking about anything you know now I am a free speech uh, fundamentalist um, that's kind of the only uh, kind of, um, I guess, absolute is, is probably a better word than fundamentalist. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's the only thing that I believe in uh, very, very strongly that I think that the moment you take, start taking things off the table, it creates anger. Um, but I also think, um, you know, feminist organisations and women's rights organisations need to take a bit of responsibility and talk about men's issues as well. Now, you know, I had a I had a um, I had a feminist friend uh, a few years ago that, mm, as we were talking uh, about kind of women's based issues, she kind of flippantly said, uh, "And you know, men kill themselves; it's the only issue, but who cares?" type thing about male suicide and. It made me realize that, um, that they want quite a lot of attention and focus rightly on women's related issues. But when it comes to men's issues, they don't really give a fig. Then what that does is it makes the other side go, hang on a minute, I would never say that about women's issues. And they wouldn't, you know, if you saw a man that said, I'm not saying that they wouldn't, actually, that's the wrong thing to say. What I'm saying is if a man was to say, who cares about domestic abuse and sexual violence, they would they would get a backlash. However, women's groups, particularly more kind of, of the kind of, the more kind of radical feminists, like the kind that we're talking about, not radical feminists as a category, but the more kind of uh, hysterical 
uh, feminist that we, we would talk about that would say something like that wouldn't actually get any backlash or wouldn't get any reaction. And I think that's really quite disgusting. You know, you have to, it, it goes back to that thing of humanizing the people that you're talking about. And we're talking about half the population, you know, either, either side. So I think we need to, discussions just need to be a little bit more civilized and a little bit more uh, uh, decent all around and more respectful all around and considerate all around as well. Um, you know, certainly that's an issue close to my own heart, um, male suicide. Um, so yeah, I just think we need to get better at having discussions all around. So I don't think you should limit yourself in terms of actually doing the the, the translations. Good luck with that, because I don't know how to do stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there's no reason why you should limit yourself. I think, I guess the only thing is, uh, like if we've had a discussion say about English politics that isn't gonna translate across and isn't gonna be relevant to some of the other countries, don't waste your time type thing but otherwise crack on mate. <laughs> That's another phrase. See, I, I am th throughout this whole conversation because this has been UK centric. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. The Americans in the audience may not understand certain phrases like, like crack on and things like that's not <laughs> like a, not a cocaine reference or anything. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of <clears throat> when you're um, mentioning identity, and mm. se segregating people from the conversation. There is something called the identity fallacy, mm. it, which I, for some reason, didn't mention earlier, in which you say that because somebody's part of a particular identity group, they're not allowed to take part in the conversation. So it's like, as you say, saying that men can't take part in the abortion conversation. It's also... <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Dying. <laughs> um, it's it's also a bit like saying, um, black people aren't allowed to talk about white supremacy because they're not white. I mean, that would be absurd. Because you imagine yeah. if someone actually yeah. came forward with that proposal. So, it, yeah, it, it people are obviously, as far as I'm concerned, they're allowed to take part in any conversation they like. It may be that they're not as clued up. It may, you know, maybe not as well educated on a particular subject, me, um, but it doesn't necessarily follow on that that is because of their identity. Um, no. I was going to um, follow up on the whole female only spaces issue as mm. well. And I'll, I'll definitely talk to Rose on Thursday about this too, mm. because I don't know where to, to, to stand. I have no um, vested interest in this so some one of the responses you might get from somebody who profoundly disagrees with you um and will dismiss you as a far right whatever is that would you have white only spaces or no. things like that no you wouldn't but there's a difference isn't there there is a there yeah this is something that's complicated i guess well it's not com it's not complicated what like toilets, do you want do you want us to? I don't really want to be hearing you shitting whilst I go for a wee. I've been to men's toilets. I used to go out clubbing. I used to go out raving uh, a few years ago, and the toilet. Like I was complaining to one of my guy friends there about the toilets, the girls' toilets, and he just grabbed my hand and took me into the men's toilet, and I was like, "This is hideous." This is absolutely disgusting. I, I couldn't ever complain about female toilets again. So I, I just think it, context matters, you know. Um, uh, certain discussions women might feel comfortable having on their own doesn't mean that they're, I think if they're, yeah, you know, uh, do you want to sit in a conversation about my period pain and the complexities of going to work when we're on the rag? You know, I don't know. It's just, it's. Uh, I think certain things have been really, really hard, hard won. Um, so that option should be there. I don't know if I'm probably contradicting myself now. Um, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> yeah. Anyone listening? Well, you um, should also know that I put quotes from this podcast on T-shirts uh, in the merch store. <laughs> 
So there's already a plethora of different ones. Uh, but please pick out your favourite ones down in the live chat. I'll look over them. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I yeah. can see you would be in a room when I talk talk about coming on the rack. <laughs> I it might be quite a long one. <laughs> yeah. Um I would certainly say that I think in some cases mm. I think I would want uh men or male only spaces. And so I, I yeah, I get it. I completely get it. Mm. Um yeah, it's just that grey area and finding out where the line is. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because I think what I what I feel quite sad about actually is that if if uh, you know a group of men were to say we want a man only space to talk about man issues, there would be some stigma to that. Whereas when a woman's rights group or or a woman's group does that, there's no stigma attached to that. So that I have a problem with. I do realise that like in this kind of equality debate, we might have overshot to the point where the kind of power balance is kind of skewed in favor of one and not the other which isn't that's not equality like ultimately we want to be in a place where everybody has the right to do whatever they they want um uh, so uh, yeah you know like i don't want to be in a room when you guys are talking about i don't know bollocks or something i don't know whatever men talk about that's actually. exactly what we talk about can't stop it's talking exactly about exactly. it <laughs> I don't know like it's a really bad example of what you guys might talk about because I know you guys don't but you, you know what I'm talking about like man things I don't know what man things are I couldn't think of anything you have it's really many bad. male friends I do I do have loads of male friends but um but I don't know what you guys talk about on your own and quite frankly like the same is true the other way around you know guys, yeah, which sure. women talk about some stuff that's completely unique to them and they're going to just talk about on the, by themselves and men talk about stuff that they're going to talk about completely by themselves you know I don't have a problem with um you know I think they call it like changing room talk right like guys that, that say some really uh, yeah you know quite uh, things that I might cringe at but equally, there's stuff that we would talk about on our own that guys wouldn't like uh, either. So, um, yeah, it's just just giving Such people a bit as... more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, because I don't know what you guys talk about. I ain't going to give away what I talk about, right? <laughs> yeah, but, well, yeah. <laughs> it's not that interesting, quite frankly. It probably isn't even. Oh, if you muted yeah. yourself. Come back. Oh, mm -hmm. audio's just sort of messed up. I don't know what happened there. Um, Let me. Is that any better? Oh, that is better. Um, there was a question um, from yeah. Brainbug a while ago, just to sort of take this track back onto the uh, uh, the train back on the tracks. Yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> Brainbug. Um, th uh, does she feel that tearing down Confederate statues in the U.S. is erasing history? did touch upon this earlier uh I, I wouldn't advocate for tearing down statues i don't think it's sensible i know there's an argument for putting them in museums but i think sometimes having things like that out in the open it helps conversation um certainly some kids are never taken to a museum parents are way too busy and they'd see stuff like that out on the streets I think it's better to have things out in the open and have conversations. You know, I think Ricky Gervais, I saw one of his live streams and he was saying, just put the nasty bit at the bottom. Like, you know, he did all this good work and was a bit of a, you know, he was a safe holder or he was a bit of a pedo type thing. He like popped the other side <laughs> like Gandhi was a pedo, <laughs> you know? Um, I think having them out in the open is the more sensible thing. When you start hiding things, it, I think it actually makes it sexier. You know, uh, Rushdie's satanic verses. Now, I'm not a Rushdie fan. Like, I like not not gen I don't mean generically. I mean, in terms of what he stands for, love the man. In terms of his writing, it makes my head hurt. My partner Jack has read every single book of his. He loves him, right? But the satanic verses, even though I don't like Rushdie's writing, I was like, because it's banned, I've got to read it. 
And, it, you know, they said that it was one of his, it wasn't one of his best books anyway, but because of all the kind of hype around it, because of all the kind of hysteria around it, it made me want to go out and get it. Um, so I think by banning something, you create like this sexy intrigue around it and make it more enticing. Um, so I think it has the opposite effect, actually. Um, so I, I'm definitely not tearing down statues. And even if we had a sensible discussion, which I think that is a sensible thing to do, I would never vote for removing anything like that because, and I have done this by myself, by the way, um, in the past, I've, um, you know, before I was kind of thinking about uh, all of these things, I have argued for, um, getting rid of something in the past because they didn't live up to the standards of that year that we were living in, which now when I think about it is a pretty stupid thing to say because, you know, 50 years from now, we're gonna look back at ourselves, like you said earlier, and think, wow, that was a stupid thing to say and do, right? And I think, I think the internet really isn't helping because what it's doing is freezing in time certain opinions that you had in certain times and certain places and people do change, that is what happens, that is life. I mean, in my life, I've been a townie, I've been a goth, I've been a, a I was a punk, I, I've had loads of phases, and look at me now, I'm completely different. You have to be, you have to have that time to evolve, both in what you might wear, and the music you might listen to, and your opinions and your thoughts and your politics, all of that needs time to build and develop. And I think the internet's making it harder for people to be able to change their minds because it's there forever, isn't it? I've been having this kind of debate with myself about whether to get rid of all of my social media because mm. I've got some really embarrassing stuff on there, you know. If I look at my social media from even 2016, I was for a very short time, I was a hysterical Remainer. Um, uh, after the referendum, I remember going, oh, this is a racist country and all that kind of being really hysterical and really unreasonable. And it was because some of my closest friends, people that I love more than you know anything in the world had voted Brexit and the reaction to them, that I was like, holy shit, I was really wrong here. Um, and I've actually completely changed my mind now. Um, so uh, part of me now looks back at that and thinks, is this a catalogue of my development or is this something that's just too embarrassing and too excruciating to look back at? And I'm having that kind of debate with myself now. Um, the problem also is that employers look at that, that everybody's looking at that to find out who you are as a person and who you are as a character, not taking into account that people change um, and not forgiving them for things that they might have said that they might cringe because of. Um, you know, I did a <laughs> I did a really embarrassing um, RT News debate a few, I think it was a couple of years ago now. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. I didn't want to go on. I was knackered. I had a week from hell. Uh, and they, they rang me a few times to ask me if I'd come on. I was like, all right, fuck it, I'll come on. Went on. And because the other guy wouldn't let me speak and get my point across, I was just like, right, I'm just going to throw this. And I just, I said some ridiculous things, but then that reflected badly on me, not on RT News, not on that other guy, on me. Um, and the thing is that's now crystallized in, in time because that's something that I can't remove. So, it, you know, we are living in weird times where things that you do and say on the internet just get stuck there. And I, I find that particularly worrying because that development of thought is really, really important. Everybody does do that. Um, whether the internet allows for that or not, I don't, I'm not convinced. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave it there because um, we could continue for a while, but I think that it's always interesting just to leave people on a thought and then they go away and they think about these things and then they hopefully come back at some point. Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm at Sadia936 on Twitter um, and my name on Facebook and Twitter on Twitter, Sadia Hamid, um, or Facebook and Instagram, sorry. Um, yeah, you can find me there. Awesome. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, coming up over the next, uh, what is going to be months, actually, let's go through all of them. So Thursday, I've got Rose of Dawn, as I said, um, trans activist. 
um, but not in the way that you might think. Uh, they're very critical of trans. So we're going to go through all the different possible bad arguments behind it. Um, and I'm sure we, we might just agree on, on several things. Then I'm going to be on Andrew Hall's channel, uh, whether he's going to, I think he'll probably pre-record and then release at a later date. So I'm going to be on the 19th. The 20th, I'm going to be with Houston, Humanists of Houston, I should say, uh, promoting fantastic fallacies. And then we still haven't sorted out a date for Randolph Richardson, present of the Canadian atheist, where we go over logical fallacies. Brazen atheist um, is going to be on talking about their time as a stripper uh, on the 29th. And then there's a, no, a number of different people that are coming on, including, including people like Mimsy, eventually. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get on, her on before she's prego. I mean, no, she is obviously prego now. But yeah, <laughs> anyway. Um, please, please, please um, support smaller uh, YouTubers and at least consider becoming a member or a patron or PayPal me or whatever it may be. Um, Sadi's got various different links down below as well. Um, but on that note, I will leave it there. Sadia, I'm so glad that we finally got you on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Take care. Take care, everybody.